Nathaniel Hackett's first offseason program is officially underway, meaning the foundation of the 2022 Denver Broncos is beginning to take shape. We'll discuss the new culture being created during this time, what the re-signings of Kareem Jackson and Malik Reed can mean for this Denver defense this season, and share some draft speculation now that we're just two weeks out from learning who the newest members of the Broncos will be. Thanks so much for joining us for Broncos Weekend. I'm Alexis Perry, joined by the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater. Good to see you, Steve. Thank you, AP. Great to see you as well. And of course, one of my favorite beat reporters of all time, Andrew Mason from DNVR and Mile High Sports Radio. How are you, Mason? I'm doing great. Good to be with you guys. Yeah. Well, this week, the players began the strength and conditioning portion of the off-season workout program. And while this portion is completely voluntary, there has been quite the turnout, probably because of the expectations this team has set for themselves. Take a listen. New culture, it's a new staff, and as one of the leaders on the team, I, I feel like it's important to, to show up, be present, and to start building the camaraderie because no matter how many guys are back from last year's team, it's, it's different. The expectation, the, the standards are being been risen to, you know, everyone's best. Everyone in the building is understanding that, you know, we have to operate at a different level. We're operating at a different standard. And, you know, I think it's, it's Russ plus, you know, Coach Hackett, you know, the new coaching staff. I think everyone is bringing that new juice, that new energy into the building. And I, I think everyone is, 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 is buying into it and, and understanding, you know, what the standard is. There's no denying the, the different energy and, and vibe in the building, the confidence, you know, guys are walking around with. We want to compete and hold up that Lombardi trophy at the end of the year. The number one thing we've talked about so far is like, man, this is, you know, this is great. We know we're going to be, you know, we're going to be competing. We're going to be in games. You know, there's obviously Russ is known for a bunch of different things, right, in a, in a positive way. Um, but what an opportunity defensively to kind of like solidify it, though. Maybe he doesn't have to have a fourth quarter comeback. You know, we get those stops that we needed. All phases got to step up now, um, you know, especially the defense. Well, it is clear that this team has its swagger back, and they've only been at the facility for a few days. So how can you guys already tell that Russell Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett have already had a profound impact on this team? Well, I would say really from the comments that the guys have made when they've uh, given different interviews, uh, everyone seems to have just a higher level of energy. And uh, we said this uh, right when Coach Nathaniel Hackett got in the building, that he has a ne another level of energy, and oh, yeah. it seems like that's rubbing off on everyone. You know, I, I think everyone realizes that we have some great pieces in place. We got, you know, great coach in place. And obviously, he hasn't been proven as a head coach. Coach Nathaniel Hackett hasn't been. But I think that he's going to do great things, uh, you know, just because of the type of person he is. Uh, but you know, they're going to have to really just get on the same page. Uh, they know a lot of work still has to be done and, and no championships have ever been won this early in the offseason. So they, they, a lot of work has to go in and uh, I think they can get there, though. Yeah, the, the energy, I think some of it's obviously Russell Wilson walking in the building because a quarterback can have that profound change, but it's not either Russell or Nathaniel. It's both combined and I right. think they're both on the same page in terms of the energy they're bringing. Now, I think Russell Wilson would hit with what he's accomplished as a quarterback. There's kind of a higher standard being brought in. And Nathaniel Hackett, I think his goal is to make a more positive, holistic environment. Like Justin Simmons was saying, the first meeting that they had earlier this week, it wasn't opening with football. Justin said, hey, you know, usually a coach comes in, talks, says who I am, what my philosophy is. Nathaniel comes in, first meeting, He's greeting guys as they walk in the door, yeah. and then he's opening saying, hey, congrats to Brett Ripping, just got married. Yeah. It's about more than football. He's trying to build a team of people that come together when it matters most. most. And so that's really profound to see in terms of the energy and culture change. And I think that's extremely important, too. That's one of the things I've always said. If you get a young guy or you know any player to let you know that you care about them, they'll, they'll run through a brick wall for you. Steve, as someone who's experienced a couple of coaching changes from Dan Reeves to Wade Phillips, then Phillips to Mike Shanahan, you know it takes a little while for things to yeah. really you know come together. How long does that usually take? Well, obviously it varies with, with different teams. Uh, I found in, in my experience at least six months though. I mean, I'm talking like into the season yeah. when actual bullets are flying. Um, you know, everything I think will go pretty smoothly up to training camp. And then, you know, once we start having the preseason games, uh, you know, the coaches will get a chance to see these guys in live action and see uh, if 
what they thought these players were. They actually are. And uh, I'm sure some things will change as the year goes on. Uh, they'll, they'll probably uh, be disappointed with some guys, and they'll be you know, over the top with some guys. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, I would say about, six, at about the six-month mark, I think the players will have a good feel for the coaches, and the coaches will have a good feel for the players. Mace, can you put it into perspective just how critical it is for these guys to be here and to be going through this offseason program, given the fact that, obviously, it's such a new regime? It's massive. I mean, for guys that are on the fringe of the roster, for example, they I mean, they don't want to waste time in making an impression. Even though you can't do teamwork right now, offense versus defense, you can make an impression just in the individual work. You can make an impression in terms of how you are in the meetings, how you're absorbing what the new coaches are throwing at you, because there is a schematic transition for everybody. Uh, in that in that building. I mean, as Bradley Chubb said on Thursday, there are a lot of similarities defensively between what E.G. or Evero, defensive coordinator, is bringing in, but the verbiage is different. So you've got to, you're going to have to adapt a little bit. So just getting those things down pat and then again, making that good first impression, it's going to be huge for a lot of these guys because one thing that the coaches said a couple of months back, they weren't going to rely heavily, too heavily on the film from last year. They right. wanted to see the guys when they came in and get to know them then and even start drawing up things schematically based on what they learn about those guys coming in. So, you know, it may be just April, but this is still a really crucial time in the development of this team. Steve, your first season under Coach Shanahan with John Elway under center, the Broncos finished 8-8. Eight and eight. And while it's clear that this team has a new energy and attitude that will make for a much better product on the field this year, given the new coach and the new system, what are some realistic expectations for this team here in 2022? Well, I think what Broncos country wants to see most is that when the players are on the field, I say this time and time again, they want to see great effort. They also don't want to see a bunch of missed assignments, a bunch of uh, you know guys running wide open. You know they, they want to see if a guy catches a touchdown pass, they want to see a defensive guy draped all over him exactly. and just say, hey man, that guy made a great play. Um, but I think realistic expectations. I, I would say record-wise, nine and eight, anything nine and eight or above, I think is a very successful season. If, even if it's you know eight and nine, I still think uh, some things will be learned. Uh, the coaches will know the players much better, and they'll have a much better idea of what needs to be done next offseason. I think making the playoffs, being one of those seven teams out of the 16 in the AFC, that is a successful year. And even then, like Steve said, 9-8, and 10-7, and seven, you could miss the playoffs at 9-8 and eight or 10-7 and, and still have a year that foundationally is getting you on the right track to go where you want to go. The thing is, this conference is just, it's stacked. Oh, yeah. The AFC West is stacked. But then you, you look around, and number one seed from last year sitting there, the Tennessee Titans, they're going to get Derrick Henry back. The Colts are improved with Matt Ryan. You go to the AFC East, the Dolphins are better. The Bills might be the favorite to be number one seed. The Patriots were a playoff team. And the AFC North is stacked pretty well, top to bottom. So there are going to be teams with Super Bowl aspirations, legitimate Super Bowl aspirations today, that are sitting there with their noses pressed against the playoff glass in, in January. You could, and, you, and this team could have a lot of things go right, set itself up for the long term, and be team number eight in that mix. And I would say it might be frustrating for Broncos fans if that happens, and even frustrating for the Broncos themselves. But long term, if they've taken the steps to kind of get the foundation right, they've got time. Russell Wilson will almost certainly sign a long-term deal in the near in the near future. There, this should be a a multiple-year window, a several-year window to get this right. So it's not a failure, I think, if this team barely misses the playoffs. And Russell Wilson keeps saying that he wants to play another 10, 12 years. Yeah. That's good news for Broncos fans. Oh, it's definitely great news. I know this music to George Payton's ears, <laughs> right. music to our ears, it's music, <laughs> music to everyone's ears. Um, and you know, he's played at such a high level throughout his career. And uh, I think him being in a in a system where he gets to showcase his passing skills even more is, is just going to do wonders for, for him and for, for, for our team. Well, we need to take a quick break, but coming up, we will discuss some of the most recent free agent signings and workouts. Don't go anywhere. April 23rd, 1989. Steve Atwater got a call from the Broncos on day one of the NFL draft. By the end of the next decade, Atwater was a two-time Super Bowl champion, an eight-time Pro Bowler, and a member of the All-Decade team. Next stop, Canton. Join us for an in-depth look back on Atwater's Hall of Fame career 
as told by the smiling assassin himself. Steve Atwater, The Road to Canton, April 21st at 8 on Denver 7. Kareem is a is an unsung hero uh, in the back end, and um, I think he, I don't think he gets enough credit, um, you know, especially with the volume that he plays at, and obviously the, you know, going into year, I believe it's 13 or 14, one of the two, and he's old, um, but for the verbiage, uh, new system, you know, coming in, and a lot of things will overlap, but there are a lot of things that are gonna be new, and it'll be great to have a guy like him. He's been around, he's seen it, he knows. Um, it's gonna be great for our younger guys, you know, to to learn from him and to overlap, like, all right, this is how we did it last year, right? But this is how it connects. Um, and obviously I can do those things too, but not nearly at the level that Kareem can do it. And so um, he's one of the most competitive guys I've been around. And uh, I mean, he gets you going. I would say I'm cool, calm and collected most times, but as soon as he starts chirping, you know, he just fires you up. And uh, so it's exciting. Welcome back to Broncos Weekend. Alexis Perry here alongside Steve Atwater and Andrew Mason. Guys, we just heard from Justin Simmons. Great news for the Broncos defensive backfield. Kareem Jackson just inked a one-year contract the day after celebrating his 34th birthday. So as we take a look at his stats from 2021, why was this yet another great decision by George Payton? Well, I think first of all, I think everybody knows that he's one of the leaders of the defense. Uh, he has the respect of really the whole team. Uh, he plays with so much heart and so much passion. Uh, I always say this, he's not a very big guy, but mm -hmm. he plays with a big heart. And uh, I think that rubs off on a lot of players in the room and a lot of players want to emulate uh, his style and his, his speed of play. Yeah, human bowling ball, right, yeah. Mace? Yeah, he is. And uh, the, the attitude as well and the leadership that he brings, I mean, I think back to the mid-2010s, the no-fly zone, and uh, that defense, as they said, had a bunch of dogs. Yep. And we're still f finding out who some of the dogs are on this defense going forward, but you know k -Jack has that in him. And then just kind of schematically in terms of personnel, uh, you've got Caden Stearns, who you like, and he's developing, but this kind of gives you an insurance policy. Now you're set one, two, three. You've got safeties that you can trust. And with a potential emphasis on six defensive back formations, I think there's going to be plenty of room for both k -Jack and and uh, Stearns to play as well alongside Justin Simmons back there at safety. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. You mentioned Caden Stearns. I know guys like him and P.J. Locke. Those were guys who are probably eager to battle it out for a starting position this year. But why is this offseason still so important for those guys, even though Kareem Jackson is back taking his rightful place on the depth chart? Long-term planning because even though you've got Jackson starting alongside with Simmons, there's still going to be a huge role. You're looking for that sixth de defensive back, that dime back. And Caden Stearns did do that pretty well at times last year. And so he, P.J. Locke, they have a chance to kind of make an impression in terms of sub-package roles. And so these next few months are going to be critical in determining, determining that. And also, Kareem's on a one-year contract. So... If these guys, if P.J. Locke impresses, Caden Stearns, even Jamar Johnson as you, as you go down the depth chart, if they impress in this offseason, then you can start kind of making your plans for next year. George Payton can say, okay, well, these guys are coming along really well. If Jackson has just one more year and then you move on from him in 2023, it's okay because we trust the young depth we've got coming up in the ranks because we saw them in, this course, in the course of this offseason. Yeah, I agree with you 100% there. And also, I think there are going to be injuries throughout the year, and you got to have great depth. And so um, for, for these guys, uh, I think it's a clean slate with the coaches. The coaches, you know, they, 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 I don't think any of these coaches have coached Kareem Jackson. I, don't think, I know none of them have coached uh, Jamar Johnson or Caden Stearns or, or P.J. Locke. So they have a clean slate. They have an opportunity. If they go out and outplay Kareem, it's a possibility that they could earn a starting position. Uh, you now, might know something about that. Well, hey, um, <laughs> you just never know. You just never know, especially you got, got new coaches, new set of eyes. You never know what, what their standard is. Uh, anything's possible. But uh, I think Kareem Jackson will be on the squad uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, but, again, I think uh, – Caden Stearns, uh, Jamar Johnson, P.J. Locke, they can all uh, come into camp knowing that they have an opportunity. Right. You know, it's not like the door is closed and 
Kareem Jackson, he's going to be our starting guy regardless of anything. Uh, they're all, they're going to have a chance to prove themselves, and I think that's a good thing. Well, outside linebacker Malik Reed, he also signed his restricted free agent tender on Monday. Pretty penny for him, too. A one-year, $2.4 million deal. He now enters his fourth season here with the Broncos. So what do you guys appreciate the most about Malik Reed's game? He's uh, a grinder. I, I love his heart. I love yeah. his heart. Uh, he's always flying to the ball. He, play, he plays special teams. He, he never complains about anything. He, he's, he's doing everything full speed. He's, he's truly a professional. Uh, and even with the signing of Randy Gregory and with Bradley Chubb uh, being back, uh, he's going to play a vital role at that edge position, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that he's back with us. And he has starting experience. He started a bunch of games over the last few years. And, you know, Steve mentioned Randy Gregory and Bradley Chubb, and you have high hopes for both of them on the edge, but both of them have dealt with injuries over the, over the years. It would probably be an upset if you get 17 starts out of both Gregory and Chubb. Inevitably, you're going to need someone to step in. And you can trust Malik Reed based on what he's done. He even led the team in sacks back in the 2020 season. Uh, he has that, ex that experience to where if he has to go in and start for a few games, you're not sweating because you know he can handle the job. Well, you mentioned Randy Gregory, of course, Bradley Chubb. This is his first offseason healthy since 2019. But I feel like the signing of Reed says something about what this team thinks about the AFC West in terms of getting after the quarterback. So why is depth at this position so critical if the Broncos really want to reach their goal of winning the West? Well, I'll be honest, I think depth is important at, at, at all the positions. You know, George Payton, he's mentioned it. Hey, everybody, in the, especially in the FC West, they got we got edge rushers coming off the end, and they're going to put pressure on the quarterbacks. And we can't be a team that lets the quarterback sit in the pocket for three, four, five seconds, and you know just pat the ball around. And uh, it, it's extremely important because, uh, like you said, there have been we have had injuries at that position in the past. Not that's not going to glass. That <laughs> that doesn't happen this year that our guys are able to stay healthy. Um, but it, I, I think it, it, it would be the, the smart thing to do if we didn't have depth. That would you know, shame on us. Right. And I think that's why you're seeing them take a look at Baron Browning on the edge as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, he started inside last year. You got Jonathan Cooper coming back, and I would be stunned if they don't add an edge to that group in round two, round three, round four, someone who can kind of help round out that, that depth chart. You you want to attack with fresh legs. You want maybe not uh, as liberally as Wade, Wade Phillips did back in the day, but you still want to be able to have at least two or three guys who can rotate in and and, and bring some fresh punch and give relief to Chubb and Gregory. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm excited to see Baron Browning on the edge. Yeah. Um, I didn't get a chance to see any of that last year during training camp. I know he played some when he was at Ohio State, but uh, man, that's going to be a treat. I, he's another guy who I feel like is a playmaker, and you can put him anywhere on the field, he's going to make plays, so it's going to be fun. And also a guy with a ton of heart. Yes. Right. Well, in other free agency news, last week the Broncos worked out two-time Pro Bowl tight end Kyle Rudolph. That is a guy that George Payton knows really well after spending a decade with him in Minnesota. So what do you guys think Rudolph's visit says about the Broncos and what they think about this current tight end room? Well, I think what it says is that they've got some pieces that aren't necessarily complete tight ends just yet. Eric Tomlinson, terrific blocker, plays at 265, plays like he's 285 or 290. Albert Okwebenom is a move tight end. He operates in space. They're going to try to train him to get better at that, but we've seen the blocking uh, has been somewhat problematic. It's taken some time for him to kind of improve in that. So in that room, those two guys, the most proven guys, they have Sean Byer in there as well, but the two most proven guys in terms of playing time, they're not really complete tight ends who can do everything. And so Kyle Rudolph is somebody who can be an inline tight end, but he can also get do some things in space. He can also get open and get involved in the passing game. So it tells me that the Broncos, you know, they have their they have their Y tight end in Tomlinson. They have an F tight end in Oak Wabenom, but they're looking for somebody who can bounce between both. Well, Kyle Rudolph, he remains unsigned, so it is yet to be seen if Denver will be his next landing spot, but that is also a position the Broncos could bolster through the draft. Well, they keep a CSU Ram here in Colorado. We will discuss that after the break. April 23rd, 1989, an unsuspecting Steve Atwater got a call from the Denver Broncos day one of the NFL draft. By the end of the next decade, Atwater was a two-time Super Bowl champion, eight-time Pro Bowler, and a member of the Hall of Fame's All-Decade team. Join us for an in-depth look back on Atwater's Hall of Fame career, Steve Atwater. 
The Road to Canton, April 21st at 8 p.m. on Denver 7. Thanks for sticking with us for this final segment of Broncos Weekend. We are just two weeks away from the 2022 NFL Draft. Like we all know, the Broncos, they do not have any first round picks, but they do have five picks between 64th and 116th. So that's not to say we couldn't see the Broncos move up. So Mace, I'd love to get your thoughts. How likely is it that the Broncos move up? And if they do, who are some realistic trade partners? I think it's more likely they move down than they move up. George Payton likes to have 10 picks. <laughs> yes, he does. That's the thing. He <laughs> And he only has eight. It, yeah, he he is a subscriber to the more darts theory. Even yep. though those darts may be later, you want to have more darts, and the more you have, the better your chances are of hitting the bullseye at some point. So right. it's it possible that if you know someone unexpectedly falls, let's say David Ojabo somehow falls through okay. round two. I don't think he will fall anywhere close, but if he does, do you think about that? even with the Achilles injury, perhaps because he's got some special attributes to him. But I actually think it's more likely that they trade down, maybe not at 64. Maybe you're talking about a trade like they had a couple, like they had in the third round. They had two trades down in the third round last year. They were able to turn one pit, one third round pick into two and get some more capital later on. I could see them making that sort of deal. Could you see them moving? Well, uh, I, I kind of I read an article that uh, something that Jerry Jones just said. Somebody asked him, "Hey, are you going to move up?" He said, "Hey, we can move up. We can move back." Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how George Payton is. He's not oh, going to yeah. he's not going to show his hand. Uh, I think we'll all find out on draft day, uh, or maybe something beforehand if they if it's some type of big deal. But uh, I don't think I don't think we'll find out <laughs> until it happens. If the Broncos stay put and we see them making their first pick at the end of the second round. What direction could you see the Broncos going with that pick? Well, the good thing is the roster is relatively complete. Yeah. So Freedom. In, ter in term exactly. They they don't they don't go in and say, okay, we have to go get a specific position. So you can you can take maybe not best player available, best player available for you because you can look at the depth and say, okay, need another edge rusher, need another corner, wouldn't mind another inside linebacker perhaps. Could use a right tackle to develop for the future. Could use a dual threat uh, tight end because we've got the two guys that kind of do one thing and the other. And they have the freedom to sit there and say, okay, if, you know, if one of, say, five guys that we like at those positions falls to 64, we can wait and take him then. Steve, any guys specifically at 64 that you really like? Uh, well, it just it depends on, on the position. Uh, I mean, if we decide to go corner, there's a guy uh, out of Mississippi State, Martin Emerson, 6'2", 201 pounds. I'm not sure if you've seen this guy, Mays. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy only gave up one pass that was more than 25 yards uh, this pr past year. Uh, I like the length on him. Uh, obviously, he's got some more developing to do, but if he's there, I, I would like to take a look at him there. Mace, give me the name of one day two guy that you hope is wearing orange and blue this training camp. I'd love to see Abraham Lucas attack a lot of Washington State uh, going to the Broncos. Now, he's a bit of a project, but that's fine. You've got Billy Turner you signed in the free agency signing period. You, you pick a tackle. He doesn't have to start right away. Excellent pass blocker. Has some work to do in run blocking because in the spread schemes that they run at Washington State, don't really have much run blocking that's going to translate to the next level. But big guy, athletic, and again, like I said, relatively far along in his development as a pass blocker, I could see him coming in and being your starting right tackle by 2023. You know, I love this time of year because we are just all living in the land of hypotheticals, including Mel Kuyper, right? He has CSU tight end Trey McBride going to the Broncos there at 64. A Colorado native, a three-sport athlete out of Fort Morgan High School. He won the John Mackey Award as the nation's best tight end last year. So there's no doubt that he would be a great story. But Steve, do you think he would be a great fit? Well, um, for me, uh, at 64, no, uh, but maybe one of the one of the other picks, uh, maybe in the in the third round. Obviously, he has the ability to be a superstar, but uh, I, I'd pass on that. I mean, McBride would be really interesting. He doesn't have any real glaring weaknesses, and he's a pretty good blocker. He's 246 pounds, and like you compare that to example, you had Noah Fant, who the Broncos traded, and he was a little a little bit heavier than. McBride, but a lot faster in terms of his time speed as well. And that's one thing where McBride kind of comes up short is in the, the 40 time. That being said, good route runner and can make up for some of that, uh, for some of the lack of time speed, at least compared to some others with his route running. 
and he is an all-around tight end who can be the move tight end as well as the inline guy. Gentlemen, thank you guys so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And a big thank you to all of you for watching Broncos Weekend. We'll see you next week.